Good morning and welcome to worship this morning. We're glad that you're here with us. If you'd like to join us on Facebook or YouTube, we'd love for you to say hello. This morning, we welcome Justin Hilden as he is coming back to begin his second year of the associate program with Pleasantville Presbyterian Church. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Come, let us worship our living God. Faithful Father, we wish it were easy to move mountains, but it seems impossible to effect even the smallest change. Grant us belief amidst our unbelief. Jesus, harbinger of hope, we long for justice and peace throughout the land, but disillusionment is easier than perseverance and apathy than imagination. Grant us hope. Help us to see signs of your kingdom in our daily lives. Holy Spirit, how we wish this torrent of bad news would just stop. Show us how to love when anger is all we feel. Infuse us with faith, hope, and love that we may live as creatures of your new creation. Amen. And hear now the assurance of pardon. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone. The new life has begun. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Amen. And now, as forgiven and loved people of God, let us share signs of peace with one another. The peace of Christ be with you. Peace to everybody. May the peace be with you. May the peace be with you. 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 Peace be with you, everyone. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> I appreciate that. Oh, hey, Brian. Hello, everybody. Oh, Brian, Brian, Brian. I know exactly what I want us to do today. Actually, Steve, I, I had an idea of what I wanted to do with you today. This is the last time we're going to hang out with all of our friends for a little while. And I really wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about how we did crafting a new reality. <laughs> You know, I, I don't think this is going to work. I think this is a conversation we need to have face to face. Wow, I can't believe that worked. So, Steve, you have done an awesome job crafting a new reality here. You have so many resources and tools. You have a safe, warm, dry home. You have a sustainable food source. You have friends like Alex. You've built some th amazing things. I can see it right over there. How does it feel? You know, Brian, it feels really good. I've made a lot of progress, but there's so much more that I want to do. So much more that I need to do. I completely understand that feeling. And I think the truth is that the work is never done when we're crafting a new reality. There is always more work that we need to do. That's true in your reality too. Everybody needs to work together. You need to make sure that you all do whatever you can to help each other stay healthy. 
You need to work to make sure that everybody has enough resources and tools. You need to work to ensure that all the systems of your reality are fair and just. And it'll take all of you to do it. You have to build something amazing. You have to bring what you have to offer. You have to be willing to ask for what you need. And remember, you can't be afraid to use some of your resources to make sure you have what you need to keep crafting a new reality. Oh, amen to that, Steve. I love that. So what are you going to do from here? I'm going to keep doing the work, keep crafting a new reality. There's still so much to explore, so much to build, so much to do. What about you? What's next in your reality? We need to learn how to work together, to find a common goal, to put aside petty differences, and to remember that we are more alike than different. We're better off if we all succeed, and we're able to accomplish so much more by our powers combined. Wait, Captain Planet? By your powers combined, I am Captain Planet! I, I hope it's okay if our new friends come and check in with you from time to time. Ah, oh, I would love it. Well, until then, as ever, be well, try hard, and do good. It was the Lorax who said, unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing's going to get better. It's not. We, we love, love you, you, and we'll, and we'll see, see you next time. time. First Corinthians chapter 13. I may be able to speak the languages of men and even of angels, but if I have no love, my speech is no more than a noisy gong or a clanging bell. I may have the gift of inspired preaching. I may have all knowledge and understand all secrets. I may have all the faith needed to move mountains, but if I have no love, I am nothing. I may give away everything I have and even give up my body to be burned, but if I have no love, this does me no good. Love is patient and kind. It is not jealous or conceited or proud. Love is not ill-mannered or selfish or irritable. Love does not keep a record of wrongs. Love is not happy with evil, but is happy with the truth. Love never gives up, and its faith, hope, and patience never fail. Love is eternal. There are inspired messages, but they are temporary. There are gifts of speaking in strange tongues, but they will cease. There is knowledge, but it will pass. For our gifts of knowledge and of inspired messages are only partial, but when it comes, but when what is perfect comes, then what is partial will disappear. When I was a child, my speech, feelings, and thinking were all those of a child. Now that I'm a man, I have no more use for childish ways. What we see now is like a dim image in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. What I know now is only partial. Then it will be complete, as complete as God's knowledge of me. Meanwhile, these three remain, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love.
reading from the book of Acts, the ninth chapter, beginning at the first verse. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as he was going along the way and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He suddenly fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, because they heard the voice, but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. He answered, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings, before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on your way here, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and his sight was restored, then he got up and was baptized. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Sometimes the story of Paul gets lost in the theology of Paul. Faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. We may memorize these pithy verses, but forget that they encapsulate the experience of Paul with the living Christ. There are many dramatic conversion stories, but what gets me about Paul is that nobody saw it coming. The earlier followers of Jesus had no shortage of conversion stories. Fishermen became apostles, tax collectors, prostitutes, even a lawyer. But Saul, the guy who just helped murder Stephen? No way, not him. There are limits. Perhaps we do not say these things out loud. We'll still confess the omnipotent, omnipresent God with no limits. But maybe... We'll stop imagining certain things. Maybe little by little, our hope evaporates. Never tossed out all in one go, but gone nevertheless. Nobody really had any hope for Saul. We don't know much about Saul's childhood. We know that he came from a better family. There weren't many Jews who were Roman citizens by birth. He received the best education and seemed to have all the right connections. I imagine that there were many people in Saul's hometown, Tarsus, 
Who had been proud of him? The town paper, if there were one, would have had lots of pictures of little Saul maybe acing his Torah exam and leading their town to victory in some competition. The way that we cut out stories of our loved ones, I imagine there are many people who held dear stories of a little Saul they once knew. But somewhere along the line, that all changed. And maybe looking back, they had been able to see some streak in him, but now it had metastasized and taken over. Their cute little Saul from Tarsus had become a fanatical murderer with the power and authority to do whatever he pleased. There is no stopping him, no reasoning. One can hold out hope for a prodigal that they'll come to their senses, but how do you hope for someone on the top of their world? I wonder how many people were scared of Saul. I wonder if they were former teachers, shop owners, or family members who felt they had to hide. What if Saul knew, would he spare me? Now, maybe none of us here today will face as dramatic a confrontation, but perhaps you too have parts of yourselves that you hide that is no less important. Maybe you have a Saul in your life. Maybe there is a coworker you avoid, a family member not spoken to or a story left untold. The hard thing about Saul was that he was dead right. His convictions had the backing of meticulous reasoning, convincing rhetoric, and even institutional authority. I'd really pity the person who'd argue with Saul. I doubt if he ever lost. Yet his soul was lost. His reasoning was dead right, correct in a way, but utterly devoid of the living God. The tragedy of Saul was getting what he wanted. Without the compassion and empathy learned in failure, Saul could only see a problem to be eliminated, not a brother named Stephen. Now, sometimes I wonder when reading this story if somebody had been praying for Saul. And now I imagine that publicly there are no more conversations from the other side. People like Saul don't tend to keep opposing voices around. His companions would have all been yes men, and I presume that there were severed connections along the way. People who had learned not to speak up out of experience or fear. Yet, in spite of everything and anything done, there are always people in our lives that we can never give up on, even if they've given up on us. I wonder if there wasn't somebody who would never stop giving Saul up to God. Now the scriptures don't give us any such backstory, but I think that part of the purpose of the Bible is to cause us to pause, to wonder, imagine, even if we never get a tidy answer, when we encounter scripture, it isn't just with words on a page, but a witness to Jesus Christ, the living word of God made flesh. And it was that Jesus who met Saul on the road to Damascus. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Lord, who are you? I am Jesus. The text says that Saul became immediately blind, that there is something like scales on his eyes. But I believe those scales have been there for years, building up, shutting out every voice but his own, shutting out even God. And the first miracle was physically manifesting what was already spiritually present. When we lose control of our bodies, like Saul did, it's amazing what we are able to hear. 
The last couple of weeks of the summer, I've been visiting with a hospital patient in Connecticut. She told me, I haven't taken a vacation in 12 years. These three weeks in the hospital are the first time I've stopped since my daughter died. When I make it out of here, I'm buying a Winnebago camper and spending those vacation days with my wife and son. He had never stopped. He told me, you're making millions one day, and then you're drinking prune juice, hoping for a bowel movement. Makes you stop and think. Have you ever stopped? Has your life ever changed so dramatically that it made you rethink everything you once thought you knew? Have you ever felt a scale drop from your heart? Jesus met Saul in a powerful way. There is no ignoring it. Some people think you have to make a decision for Jesus. That may be true, but I don't think that Saul was faced with any decision. Saul was met with Jesus. There is no debate to be had, deliberation to make, or argument to win. Jesus spoke to Saul, and there is no going back. Saul's life had changed, no matter how you slice it. When Jesus calls, it is irresistible. That's why it's called grace. It is holy God, nothing we deserve. That's why it didn't matter one iota what Saul had done. Jesus was calling him, and that's all that really mattered. God gave Saul faith that day. So why, why doesn't the story stop here? Saul met Jesus, surely that is enough. Why does the story go on? Well, Saul wasn't the only person needing saving that day. There's Ananias. Now, Ananias already knew Jesus. Ananias was a disciple. Ananias never stopped believing in God. There wasn't a day he didn't pray or count the cost of being a disciple. When he heard that Saul was coming to Damascus, the thought of martyrdom likely crossed his mind. How could it not with everyone talking about it constantly? Now Ananias wasn't afraid. He knew his soul was right with God. Faith was not his problem. His hope was gone. Ananias never doubted the power of God, but he had stopped imagining hope a long time ago. Maybe it was the only way he knew how to continue. How can you live with hope when day after day you see the opposite all around you? Better be stiff upper lip, not say anything, and continue forward. That's all we can do, right? Now, hope. Hope is a theological virtue. Hope comes to us from the outside. Hope is a gift from God. That day, God wanted to give Ananias hope. Hope that no one, no authority, no power, not even any person, is outside the grace of God. Jesus replied to Ananias, Go, for Saul's a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name. So Ananias departed. The Saul of his worst fears was beyond that door. But instead of fleeing, Ananias entered in hope. And when Ananias entered that room, he laid his hands on him and saying, Brother Saul, brother. Ananias loved Saul. Before he had even been healed, love paved the way. It was love that met Saul on the road. Love that never gave up on him. It was love in that room where Jesus healed both Saul and Ananias. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. The center of Paul's theology present here in the beginning. 
faith, hope, and love, gifts of God for the people of God. In that moment, Saul's life was transformed. He never stopped preaching, teaching, or living that until his dying day. In the end, that was all that really mattered. Amen. Let us pray together for the church, the world, and all in need. Let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For your church in every place, that we may worship and faithfully serve you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For leaders and people in every land, that they may know your will and do your will. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the earth that you have made, that it may flourish in beauty and show your glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all who hunger and thirst, that they may be filled with good things. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. For those who are ill or close to death, that they may know your loving care. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Receive all these prayers, O God, in the tenderness of your mighty hand, and strengthen our hands to serve you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now let us pray together in the words our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now hear these words of benediction. May your faith be steadfast in Jesus, whoever holds us fast in his hands. May you hope in Christ's resurrection and see renewal throughout the land. May the love of God transform you 
in all the places of your heart. May you never fail to witness how faith, hope, and love saved even a people like us. Amen. Amen.